Hey Ember Tide, thanks so much for joining us in our service today. We're going to kick off our service with Advent, and uh, if you remember last week, we talked about all the things that the Advent wreath symbolizes as we go through this time of waiting uh, for Christmas and how we, we wait for the coming of Jesus. And let's just kind of recap what those things meant. Do you remember the, the wreath is shaped in a circle, and so it reminds us that God is everlasting, that he has no beginning, no end. And then it's also made up of these evergreen boughs. And so that reminds us that we can have eternal life uh, because of Jesus. And the red berries, uh, holly berries, remind us that Jesus shed his blood for each and every one of us. And so that's kind of helping us remember what Christmas is all about. And then we have the, the candles and all the candles remind us of uh, that Jesus came to be the light of the world, you know, that he came to dispel the darkness uh, and that he is the light of life. And so it's, it's very symbolic of these candles and each of these candles represents a different part of the Christmas story for us. And uh, do you remember what last week was? Yeah, that's right. It was the prophets and the prophets were there to tell the story of Jesus that he was going to be coming hundreds of years before he was born. And that he was, he was there to be God's plan. That God, this wasn't like a, uh, you know, plan B or, uh, you know, an afterthought. That God's design was for Jesus to come and to save us from our sins. And then this week, we are lighting the angel's candle. And the angels play a major part in the Christmas story. And you see them all over the place. And when we think of angels, we often think of like the cute little babies with little tiny wings playing harps, you know, like the cherubs kind of thing. But angels, every time we read about them, one of the first things they say is, don't be afraid. Like that must have been an amazing sight to see these angels appear in the Christmas story. And they show up a lot. I mean, they appear to Zechariah to tell of the birth of John the Baptist. They, they appear to Mary to tell her about Jesus. They appear to Joseph. They appear to the shepherds in a passage we're going to look at today. But every time they do, it's this amazing announcement of something that God wants to share with his people. And so that reminds us, you know, that, that as the people of God, we are called to share that as well. And so the angels are always uh, an important part of the story as God's messengers, uh, being the ones to communicate a message as well. And so as we light the angel's candle, uh, we're getting closer to the Christ candle at the center. Uh, and so we look forward to the rest of the Advent season. Let us uh, just begin our time with prayer. Let me pray. Father God, as we uh, continue through this Advent journey of waiting and thinking and preparation, we just pray that you would help us to embrace the, the process, that you would help us to embrace the waiting, to allow us to reflect on who you are and what you've done. And that as the angels proclaim that you are Emmanuel, that you are God with us, and that, that you are the Prince of Peace. And uh, so, Lord, we, we give glory to that. We worship that, Lord, and we just ask that you would help us to enter into this Christmas season and, and move through the busyness to a place where we can rest in who you are and worship you because of who you are and have joy throughout this Christmas season. In Jesus' name, we pray all these things. Amen. Before we go into the message, I wanted to just share with you a couple of quick announcements. And the first is that we're having our annual Covenant Partner Meeting on December the 15th here at the church. Uh, it's not on a Sunday, so it will be a proof of vaccination kind of event only, unfortunately. Uh, but we want to invite those of you who are covenant partners with us to be able to come and to gather. Uh, and we want to share some of the highlights from this year. We want to share some of the challenges. We also want to uh, propose to you our new budget for 2022. And so we want to encourage you to come out to that December 15th here at the church at 7 p.m. And uh, we hope to see you there for that. Also, throughout this month, uh, over the next few Sunday evenings, we're going to be having some special youth events. Uh, each Sunday, uh, from 5 to 6.30, we're going to have uh, Advent suppers with our students from middle school and high school. 
and we'd love to have you come and uh, enjoy some time together. Uh, just be able to get to hang out a little bit and I know that it's been a rocky year so we want to be able to kind of connect over the Christmas season uh, and so we invite you to that. Um, so please uh, keep those in your calendars and, and we'll have those over the next uh, three Sundays from the 5th until the 19th. Uh, then after that, uh, we're also having a, a young adult cafe, Advent cafe. And so starting at seven o'clock, we'll have our young adults come in uh, just to hang out for a little bit and just to catch up and see how things are going uh, and be able to just pray with you guys and uh, just to, to get together and, and have some community that way. So want to be able to just share with you those two events. And then also just want to say a big thank you to all those who dropped off items for our Christmas care project. Uh, and we are just overjoyed with the response. And I know a lot of you have either given financially or dropped off goods. And so on behalf of the church, I just want to say thank you so much for your willingness to uh, to be like Jesus and to do what Jesus did in this manner. And so we will look forward to dropping those things off uh, at the middle school in the days to come. All right, so we're going to jump into week two of Christmas Playlist. Ye faithful, joyful and triumphant, O come, ye, O come, ye to Bethlehem. Come and be.
thanks shall be wonderful counselor his name shall be All right, everyone, we are jumping into week two of our Christmas sermon series called Christmas Playlist. And if you remember from last week when I introduced it, uh, the premise behind the whole series is that we're going to use Christmas carols and Christmas songs to kind of help drive home some truth about Jesus and what God has done for us. Uh, over the Christmas season and uh, allowing those things to uh, allowing those Christmas carols to kind of help us explore that. And so last week, if you remember, we talked about Andy Williams' Christmas song, "The Most Wonderful Time of the Year." And you remember we talked about how actually Christmas for a lot of us isn't the most wonderful time of the year. Uh, it can be really messy, and our because our lives are really messy, and how God demonstrates His love for us by sending Jesus. Emmanuel, God with us, into the mess of our world uh, so that we could be saved. And so this week, I want to start off by sharing with you one of my favorite Christmas albums. And this is Stephen Curtis Chapman's album, All I Really Want for Christmas. What I love about this Christmas album is, one, it's got some really cute moments with his daughter on it, uh, where she reads some scripture or tells you know a, a story. Uh, but it also, Chapman has this amazing gift to be able to take, you know, traditional Christmas carols and just kind of put a fresh arrangement on them so that they're, they're new, but they still keep all their, you know, their luster and their shine from what they are as classic Christmas carols. And one carol that he does that with in this album is O Little Town of Bethlehem. And that's our song on the Christmas playlist this week, O Little Town of Bethlehem. This carol was written in the 1800s, and it was written by uh, a Methodist minister named Philip Brooks in Philadelphia in uh, the late 1800s. And so the story behind it goes that uh, Brooks would travel to, to Israel in, uh, on a trip in, uh, during the Christmas season. And one of the parts of his trip was, was going on Christmas Eve from Jerusalem to Bethlehem on horseback. And during that trip uh, from, from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, uh, he comes outside of Bethlehem uh, and stands in the fields where the shepherds would have been, where they would have heard the angels proclaim the birth of Jesus. And he looks out over the town. 
Uh, and then he would reflect on that, and that would become the fuel for the hymn, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Fast forward a couple years later, and it's Christmas Eve in Philadelphia, and Brooks needs a new Christmas carol, or a new Christmas piece, for the kids' choir to sing on Christmas Eve. And he can't find anything, and he doesn't know what to do, and so what he does is he writes his own. And so he uses that experience from his trip to Bethlehem as you know, the fuel and the dynamic for the, the carol itself. And he hands it to his organist and says, listen, could you put some music to this? And the organist, you know, is just killing himself, trying to find something that will fit. And nothing seems to be working until, you know, the day before Christmas Eve. And uh, he's still trying to find some music and he goes to bed and he has this restless sleep and he wakes up and the tune, as we hear it now, pops into his head. And they create O Little Town of Bethlehem. What I love about O Little Town of Bethlehem is really uh, what Brooks writes in the first verse. And I want to read that to you. And it says this, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie, thy deep, above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark street shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. And what I think Brooks does is, he captures this tension uh, so well between the hopes and fears of the Christmas season. Now, that might strike you as a little bit odd or funny, maybe even, that we would talk about fears at Christmas time. You know, it's supposed to be this bright and jolly kind of season. That's what everyone looks forward to. Um, yet in the midst of this, there are some fears around the Christmas season. There are some things that seem to be exasperated or seem to be, you know, highlighted during the Christmas season itself. And so what I really want to talk about is peace. But in order to do that, what we need to do is we need to talk about fear as well. And the Christmas season can bring out some crazy fears, uh, especially ones that are diagnosed by the American Journal of psychologists, and some of them are specifically around the Christmas season. And I wanted to share a couple of these uh, wacky ones with you, uh, some things that people honestly really struggle with. One is cellophobia, and this is the fear of bright and flashing lights. Uh, so if that's your fear, man, you're having a rough time this time of year, because everywhere you look, there's bright and flashing lights. Uh, for others, this might be a good one to kind of tuck away in your back pocket. It's called syngenesophobia. And what that is, is it's the fear of relatives. You know, so uh, maybe you've got some of those in-laws coming to visit over the Christmas season. You can just say, hey, listen, my syngenesophobia is acting up. I don't think we can have you in. Uh, and so uh, maybe next year, you know, <laughs> you might be able to use that. But don't tell them I said that, okay? okay don't tell them. Um, and then the last one I want to just share with you is just strictly because it's so hard to say. It's such a huge uh, name I wanted to share it with you, and it's called Christugenia tickphobia, and that is the full-blown fear of Christmas. So everything around the Christmas season just makes you scared, whether it's the Santa, the turkey, you know, the lights, the decorations, whatever it is, it's all causing you a lot of fear. Those are some wild fears. I mean, those are just some, some pretty crazy phobias, but I want to talk about fears that go a little bit deeper than that. I want to talk about those fears that cause us uh, to feel like we're stuck. Those, those phobias that are, those fears that are just so ingrained in who we are that they keep us from ever moving forward in our lives or in our relationship with Jesus or our relationship with others. Some of those kinds of fears might be things like the fear of being insignificant. The fear that, you know, as you look back at the end of your life, that you'll never see anything worthwhile, that your legacy isn't there. And so you're scared that, that your life will never amount to anything. For some of us, maybe it's the fear that our marriage is going to fall apart. Um, you know, it, it feels like it's so rocky right now that you're just scared that, that it'll all just crumble. Maybe for others, it's the fear of, of not living up to expectations that your parents might have had for you or feel like you let them down because you didn't make a, 
a career path decision or that you chose to go a different way and you're, you're afraid that you've let them down. For some of us, maybe as parents, we're scared of what choices our kids are going to make when they go off to university or when they're out from underneath of our roof. Those are fears that can cause us a lot of struggle. Um, and I want to just talk about how God addresses those fears and really just want to spend time talking about two questions. Um, really, you know, what is, you know, what, it, what are we afraid of? What are we afraid of? And how does God address those fears in our life? How does God address those fears in our life? And to do that, we're going to look at Luke chapter 2. And what we're going to see in the, in the Christmas story, even if you just read the first couple chapters of Luke, um, you're going to see that the Christmas story is actually crammed full of fear. Like there's, it's jam-packed with scary moments, with fearful moments. Whether you go to Zechariah and, and the angel Gabriel appearing before Zechariah, and it says that he's struck with terror, or when Gabriel appears before Mary and Mary was, was so afraid, um, or Joseph, like we read last week, and how Joseph was scared. And it seems like the angel, the first thing the angels always have to say is, Fear not, um, because it was just a, a scary and, and terrifying moment. And then there's the shepherds who are confronted with this chorus of angels. And the first thing the angels again say, fear not, um, because they were so afraid. We see it all over the place. So let's look at Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 13. And it says this, That night there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them. Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will be of great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and peace on earth to those with whom God is pleased. So let's deal with the first question. Why are we so afraid? What are we afraid of? Verse 9, I think, helps us answer this. In verse 9, it says, Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them, and they were terrified. I want to just focus in on God's glory for a second. This goes all the way back to Genesis. And do you remember when Adam or when Adam and Eve were created by God, they were created in the image of God. That humanity was created to be these image bearers of who God is. And so if you want to say that a different way, we were really created to reflect God's glory. We were created to reflect his characteristics, you know, his his goodness, his perfection, his kindness, his, his beauty. And yet we all know that when Adam and Eve uh, disobeyed and introduced sin into the world, that image was tarnished. And sin comes into the world and creates this gap. And what I mean by that is there is now this gap between what God intended the world to be and our understanding of that versus what actually exists now. And so in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, it tells us that all have sinned, we've all sinned, and fallen short of the glory of God. That now we can no longer demonstrate those things that we were designed to, to demonstrate, that we were designed to reflect. And so sin has kind of created this gap between who God designed us to be and who we really are. And because of that gap, we see things that terrify us. We see things that scare us. The gap between what we know to be true and what we really are kind of creates this, this terrible fear that we have. You know, in that gap lives rejection, lives uh, criticism, lives anger, lives failure, lives injustice, lives, you know, murder, lives hatred. And those things can scare us to death. Sin has entered in and created a gap. 
And the result is that we are full of fear. So how has God answered our fears? How does God deal with that, uh, that fear in our lives? Well, that's what the Christmas story is all about. In verse 11, we hear about the angel's message. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born to you today in Bethlehem, in the city of David, and you will recognize him by this sign, that you will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth and lying in a manger. As soon as the angel makes that announcement, what happens is like heaven explodes, and a host, an army of angels appear in the sky in front of the shepherds, and they sing about the glory of God in the highest heaven, and what comes to earth, and peace on whom God's favor rests. Peace comes through God's glory. And what that means for us is that Jesus, our Emmanuel, God with us, begins to work in our hearts and serves as a bridge to gap between, to, to gap between what we, we know God created us to be versus what we actually are. And so Jesus comes and he covers that gap. And what he does is he begins to regenerate within our hearts, that heart to reflect God's glory once again. And so we begin to reflect more day by day of God's glory to the world around us. By bridging that gap, Jesus brings peace into our lives. He allows us to have peace even in the midst of our fears. But the truth is really, and you know this is true, even though some of us who are watching have have Jesus in our lives and understand that Jesus came to bridge that gap, we're we're still scared. We're still fearful. So what do we do with our fears? What do we do with those fears? Well, I think first, the first thing we need to do is, is wrestle with, what we are scared of the most in our heads. Think about what scares you the most. What is it the thing that limits your life? What is it that keeps you from stepping into the life that God has designed you to live? And I think there are two things we can do with that fear. Do you have it in your head? Do you have what that fear might be for you? There's two things we can do with that. The first thing I think we need to do is we need to let that fear drive us to Jesus. Because I think we all can understand that fear is this amazing driver. It causes us to do things that sometimes are just flat out irrational. It causes us to take action. It causes us to make decisions. It causes us to to divert our paths. It causes us to do all sorts of things that may not necessarily be that healthy for us, all because we're fearful. But what we need to understand is instead of allowing those fears to drive us to lay in bed at night awake and wringing our hands and living with anxiousness, we need to let those fears drive us to Jesus. Because what we'll see when when we come to Jesus with those fears is that Jesus responds to all of those fears and deals with them. If you look throughout the Bible, I don't think there are too many fears that we can come up with that Jesus doesn't address in the scriptures. For example, maybe for you that fear is your past. Maybe you think that all the failures that you've had in your past or the bad decisions that you've made disqualify you from being loved by someone. That for some reason that if they knew who you really were, they would never love you. Well, Jesus tells you that if we confess our sins, that Jesus is faithful to forgive us of our sins and remove all unrighteousness from our lives. He's willing to give us a new start, a new creation, we're called in, in Corinthians. Or maybe for some of us, um, the fear is, like I had said at the beginning of the message, about just being insignificant, about not being a somebody, about not having you know, accomplished something in this life. And Jesus says that, you know, no matter what, you are his masterpiece, that you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, and that there's nothing that you can do to earn God's love, that it's there for you no matter what. 
Or maybe you're feeling financial pressure. Maybe your big fear is that I just, I, I don't have any security. I'll never have enough money. And Jesus tells us that, you know, that we can have our security in him. Jesus says that I'll supply all of, for all of your needs according to my riches and glory. And so we need to understand, and that's just a short little list, that we need to understand that no matter what kind of fears we might have, Jesus can address those things in our lives because he came to bring peace to our hearts. So, one, let your fear drive you to Jesus. Second thing we can do with our fears is let faith drive you through those fears. Let your faith drive you through those fears. And so instead of letting fear have the wheel of your life, so to speak, you take those fears and you give them to Jesus and you allow Jesus to drive you right through that fear. I, I can't help but imagine, you know, this picture in my mind of evil Knievel jumping through this burning hoop and, you know, just getting through that unscathed. And that's what I kind of picture, you know, that Jesus is able to just kind of crash us right through whatever's terrifying us or whatever's scaring us. We all know that those fears don't just automatically disappear, but that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, to take us through those fears and walk us through those things. It's, it's saying, Lord, I trust you in the midst of this, that I trust you to, with my life. I trust you with my fears. Uh, one of the, the, the great lessons uh, that Christy Short has taught my family, uh, and if Christy's watching this, we miss you guys. We hope things are going well in Fredericton. One of the things that Christy taught our family was to hold things with open hands. Um, and I just love that concept, that there are things that we cannot control, but yet we have to just bring them to God with our open hands. And, and open hands are like this universal symbol of surrender. And we need to say to Jesus, listen, these are our fears that I have in my life, and I openly lay them before you. I surrender these things, and I trust them to, to you. And I think that's an important, important act for us to do on a daily basis even. And maybe our biggest fear is this lack of control, and maybe that's what we need to surrender first, is our willingness to let go of things. But as we wrap up, I just want to share with you this last verse of Old Little Town of Bethlehem. And it's really this beautiful prayer um, that, that we can all pray in our lives. Pray that Jesus would, would come into our lives and recognize that, you know, we aren't living the way that God intended us to and that there is this giant gap, but that only Jesus can bridge that gap for us. And he's willing to do that if we would surrender and hold things with an open hand. And let me just pray this prayer uh, as we wrap up this last verse of, of O Little Town of Bethlehem. O holy child of Bethlehem, descend to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter in, be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. O come to us, abide with us, our Lord, Emmanuel. Amen.